Here's the second video for this week. Um, we're on chapter 10. And as you might recall, it's about early, early Paleozoic Earth history. And the early Paleozoic are the first three periods of the Paleozoic. The first being the Cambrian, then the Ordovician, then the Silurian. I'm going to go over the, the main points of these. I'm not going to go over everything. That's why it's important to watch the videos. Only the things that are covered in the videos will be on the test. We mentioned earlier on that there were four supercontinents you needed to remember. The first one's Columbia, which existed about two billion years ago. Then we had Rodinia, which existed one billion years ago. Both of those ex existed during the Proterozoic Eon. For the early Paleozoic, there was a supercontinent called Pinotia that came together 600 million years ago, but started to break apart 550 million years ago. And I'll just spoil the story for you a little bit on the Paleozoic and tell you that 245 million years ago, which is the end of the Paleozoic, that's when Pangaea came together. And Pangaea would break apart during the Mesozoic era. During the early Paleozoic, there were six main continents that we need to remember. Baltica, China, Gondwana, Kazakhstania, Laurentia, which means ancient North America, as you might recall, and Siberia. Okay. Um, we'll take a look at these six continents and see how they moved over time. You're not, don't worry, you're not going to have to remember every single little thing about how they moved. Just the main points that we're going to cover. We're also going to talk about how Epiric Seas transgressed and regressed over the North American continent primarily, or otherwise known as Laurentia. What in God's name is an Epiric Sea? You've probably never heard of that before. Well, an Epiric Sea is a shallow sea, and they don't exist anymore. But during time, portions of Paleozoic and Mesozoic history, the oceans covered most of the continents with a shallow ocean. And... When I say a shallow ocean, I'm talking between usually 10 to 50 feet deep. The water was shallow, and it covered up the continents, and that's what we call an Epiric Sea. When you get a transgression or a major sea level rise, and the seawater covers up a continent, we, then the Epiric Sea transgresses onto the continent. When these Epiric Seas retreat, exposing the land, then we have a regression. We're also going to be talking about mountain building and where it took place during the Paleozoic era. Mountain building primarily occurs, you might recall, due to subduction or to the colliding together of continents. So you either have seafloor, ocean, oceanic lithosphere subduct at a trench, that'll produce mountains. Or, if continents collide together, that's going to produce mountains. Let's take a look here at Laurentia, North America, during the Paleozoic, otherwise known as Laurentia. This picture here gives you, it, it is really useful. This map is really useful if you want to understand what Laurentia was like during the Paleozoic era. It might look complicated, but you can do it. We have this dark brown area here. That's called the Canadian Shield. We have a light brown area. That's the platform. You might recall the platform is a place where Precambrian rocks, rocks that are older than 542 million years old, are present, but they're buried by, they're buried, they're covered up by younger rocks, Phanerozoic rocks. We have 
So a sh Canadian Shield and the Laurentia platform in light brown. The green areas are called basins. And a basin is a big hole in the ground where sediment accumulates. Then these orange areas are called domes, like the Astrodome if you're a sport fan, sports fan, or the Superdome. They're like they're like a, imagine a cereal bowl upside down. That's a, a dome. These stick up over the water. So even when the Epiric Seas covered much of Laurentia, these areas in orange called domes would mostly be above sea level because they stuck up. They were topographic highs. The blue areas here show you the four mountain belts that were added on to the craton of Laurentia. Remember the craton is both includes the dark brown area plus the light brown area. The light brown area is the platform for Laurentia. The dark the dark brown area is the shield where you have Precambrian rocks exposed at the surface of the earth. And if you walk anywhere in this dark brown area, you're going to find rocks that are Precambrian, older than 542 million years old, exposed at the surface of the earth. The light brown area also existed during the Precambrian, before 542 million years ago. These blue areas did not exist 542 million years ago. Bottom line is what this map is showing you is that the coastline of Laurentia is here, here, and here 542 million years ago. So bottom line is 542 million years ago, Florida did not exist. Nova Scotia did not exist. California did not exist. Nevada, Idaho, most, most of Idaho did not exist. Washington, Oregon, and most of Alaska did not exist. This was the coastline 542 million years ago because the craton is the light brown and the dark brown area together. That's what the continent of Laurentia looked like 542 million years ago. After 542 million years ago, we had four mountain built, belts that were added on to Laurentia. And we got the Appalachian Mountains. And I'll just tell you now that they were added on to Laurentia 290 million years ago. And so were the Wachita's here. The small mountain range down here. The Wachita's. These mountain ranges up here in the Northwest Territories of Canada were added on during the Mesozoic Era. And so were the so was the Cordillerian Mountain Belt. The Cordillerian Mountain Belt is the Rocky Mountains. In North America, we call it the, the the Rocky Mountains. But why do we use the word Cordillerian? Because this Cordillerian mountain belt goes all the way down into Mexico, and we're going to see it goes all the way down the west coast of South America. So the Cordillerian mountain belt includes the Rockies, but it includes the Andes all the way down in the west coast of South America. Green areas were dome or, or basins, big holes in the ground where sedimentary rocks are especially thick. They're, so the th sedimentary record is especially thick in these green areas. And these orange areas were above sea level. So even when the Epiric Seas transgressed onto the Laurentian continent, these areas in orange stayed above water, including the Nashville Dome here in Tennessee, was almost entirely above sea level during the entire Paleozoic era. So we, how do we know these continents were, were um, uh, in the past? For example, here's a, the Cambrian, the first period of the Paleozoic. How do we know that the continents actually were here? Well, we know from some of the greatest minds in geology studying paleoclimate, paleomagnetics, fossils, stratigraphy, sedimentology. Geologists from all around the world have been studying sedimentary rocks and 
and looking at the clues in those sedimentary rocks to figure out um, the fossils will tell you what the climate was like, for example. The magnetic minerals will point to magnetic north and they'll show you the longitude and latitude of continents. And if you study sedimentary rocks and you go into geology, we can actually reconstruct coastlines too because on coastlines you have beaches and beaches produce well-sorted quartz sandstones and they commonly have bivalve fossils or brachiopod fossils. So in order to study the paleogeography of the world, paleo means ancient, the ancient geography of the world, we study sedimentary rocks. You got to remember those periods of the Paleozoic. Um, I think um, I gave you a rhyme. Poor people missionaries don't suck other creatures. That, but my girlfriend gave you a better rhyme, which is not R-rated, and that's "Pretty poppies make Dorothy sleepy." Order coffee, so you can use that too if you want to. Permian, Pennsylvania, Mississippian, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, Cambrian. So if we're going to talk about Paleozoic history, we're going to start off by talking about the first period of the Paleozoic, which is the what? The Cambrian. So during the Cambrian period, this is what the world looked like. And here you can see the six continents. The six continents include Laurentia, ancient North America, Baltica, ancient Europe Siberia what is Siberia well let's take a look here let's take a look at a map of Siberia uh, for those of you who do, are not familiar with Russia Russia is the biggest country in the world all this area here east of Moscow, going all the way to Vladivostok, that's Siberia, east of the Ural Mountains. Okay, so th that was another continent, Siberia. Kazakhstania, which is Central Asia, it has nothing to do with Borat. <laughs> then we got China, which was attached to Gondwana. Now what is Gondwana? Gondwana is all of the southern continents that we have today, including Antarctica, South America, Australia, Africa, and India, too. So Gondwana was a great, all the southern continents of today were contained in Gondwana. China was attached to Gondwana. Laurentia is over here, and Siberia is here, and Baltica is over here. That's during the Cambrian period. Now let's take a look and see how these continents m have moved. Geologists call this the dance of the continents. So if you want to memorize this, just think of the different dance partners on the dance floor. Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia, Kazakhstan, China, and Gondwana. Now let's see where they moved into the next period, which is what? The Ordovician. Okay, so here's the Cambrian. By Ordovician time, all you need to remember there's a few things that happen. China separated from Gondwana. And then you have, but the, the main thing you want to remember is Laurentia and Baltica move closer together. There used to be an ocean between Laurentia and Baltica called the Iapetus Ocean. Obviously, it no longer exists, but it's recorded in the geologic record. Avalonia, by the way, is Britain. We're not going to talk too much about it. But ancient North America, Laurentia, and ancient Europe, Baltica, cl get closer together by Ordovician time, so that the Iapetus Ocean becomes more narrow. That's the main thing you want to remember. Laurentia and Baltica are here. You can see during the Cambrian, they move closer by Ordovician time. What period comes after the Ordovician? The Silurian. So by Silurian time, what happens? Well, Baltica and Laurentia almost collide, right? 
they almost come together they coming real close together and in the next chapter you're going to see by Devonian time Laurentia and Baltica will collide together to make a new continent called Laurasia so Laurasia Laurasia is the name of the continent when, that was formed when Laurentia and Baltica came together forming one continent and we're going to call it Laurasia and so during the later part of the Paleozoic we have Laurasia and Laurasia will eventually um, collide together with the other continents at the end of the Paleozoic, at the end of the Permian, in other words, Permian period, to form Pangaea. Here is um, a diagram. And this diagram is very important to remember. And in every historical geology country in the United States, historic, in every historical geology class in the United States and Canada, we use this diagram. And it shows you the cratonic sequences of North America. The cratonic sequences of North America. It might be confusing to you to, when you first look at this diagram, but I'm going to break it down so you can understand what a cratonic sequence is, too. That's because that's our goal by looking at this slide. So first thing you want to see over here, we've got the periods. This symbol means Cambrian. So this is the Cambrian period, then the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, then the Mississippian. And this funny looking P is the Pennsylvanian Permian. And at the end of the Permian is the end of the Paleozoic. And then we get into the Mesozoic, which is the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period. And then finally the Cenozoic era up here. Okay. So this is geologic time from older to younger. You've got to memorize all these. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Permian, I'm sorry, Pennsylvanian, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous for the Mesozoic. And then we get to the Cenozoic era. Over here, you have Cordillerian mountain building episodes. And other, what, they're, what they're telling you is that mountain building, the land was pushed up on the west coast of Laurentia, on the west coast of ancient North America during these five episodes, only one of which is during the Paleozoic. Note that almost all of the mountain building on the west coast of Laurentia occurs m later on during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. On the east coast, you can see almost all of the mountain building on the east coast to form the Appalachian Mountains and the Wachitas occurred during the Paleozoic. That's very important to remember. During the Paleozoic era, mountain building occurred on the eastern margin of Laurentia, on the eastern edge of North ancient North America, Laurentia, due to subduction on our east coast. Subduction on our west coast occurred primarily during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic era, when subduction occurred on the west coast of North America. Here you can see the six, one, two, three, four, five, six cratonic sequences of North America. These were first produced in 1963 by a man named Lawrence Sloss in 1963 Dr. Sloss who worked for ExxonMobil the ExxonMobil Corporation has made tens of billions of dollars from this diagram obviously they're, they want to know about oil and gas and where to drill for it So what are these cratonic sequences? Well, first of all, let me just say that the first cratonic sequence is called the Sauk, represented by this brown area, then the Tippecanoe, then the Kaskaskia, then the Absaroka. 
these other cratonic sequences up here we don't need to talk about until later on in the class called the Zuni and the Tejas. We're only concerned with the Paleozoic cratonic sequences listed here, which are the Sauk, Tipicanu, Kaskaskia, and Absaroka. Let me write those down. The first cratonic sequence is called the Sauk, then the Tipicanu, then the Kaskaskia, and then the Absaroka. As you why do they have such weird names? Well, they're they're not really weird. They're Indian names, uh, Native American names. Uh, I just memorize it by acts. A K T S, A K T S. The last cratonic sequence is the Absaroka, and the first is the Salk. The second is the typical of the third is Cascassia. Now, what are these cratonic sequences? That's the next question. These are sed accumulations of sedimentary rocks that are deposited by transgressions. I repeat that. Each of these cratonic sequences was produced by a transgression, rising sea level. These white areas in between the cratonic sequences are points in Paleozoic time that were not recorded in the rock record. They're not recorded in the rock record. There are unconformities here, missing time. Another way of saying it is, when sea level rises and the pyric seas cover up the continents, you form thick sequences of sedimentary rocks. When sea level retreats and the land is exposed, you have erosion and you lose rocks and you produce unconformities. So, knowing that, you can figure out the history of Laurentia, ancient North America, during the Paleozoic rega with regards to sea level. See if you can follow me here. During the Cambrian period, the first period of the Paleozoic, sea level rose and covered up Laurentia, depositing a thick sequence of sedimentary rocks called the Sauk Sequence. At the end of the Cambrian, we had a regression. Sea level fell, and we formed this unconformity between the Sauk and the Tippecanoe se Sequence. Then sea level rose during the Ordovician period, depositing the Tippecanoe sequence of rocks, the Tippecanoe cratonic sequence of rocks. At the end of the Ordovician, sea level fell, forming an unconformity. We had a regression forming this unconformity. At the beginning of the Silurian, the, the next Epiric Sea, the Kaskaskian Sea, invaded Laurentia, covered up Laurentia, and it covered up Laurentia until the end of the Devonian. At the end of the Devonian, sea level retreated, and we formed an unconformity. Then, the, the last Epiric Sea of the Paleozoic covered up Laurentia, and that's called the Absaroka Sea, which lasted into the Permian. If you don't understand that, just rewind this video and listen to it again. The Sauk Sea invaded the land first, and then it retreated at the end of the Cambrian, forming an unconformity. Then the Tippecanoe Sea, a pyric sea, covered up Laurentia and deposited a thick sequence of rocks representing the Ordovician period. We had a regression forming an unconformity. At the beginning of the Silurian, sea level rose, and it covered up Laurentia, depositing Silurian and Devonian rocks. Then we had a regression at the end of the Devonian, forming an unconformity. Then, during the Mississippian and Permian time, the, the very last periods of the Paleozoic, the last sequence of sedimentary rocks are deposited, called the Absaroka Sequence.
So geologists can use these sequences um, to identify when sea level rose and sea level fell. What did Laurentia look like during the early is part of the Paleozoic called the Cambrian period? Laurentia looked like this and we'll talk about this map in the next video.